Our second reading is coming from the Gospel according to Matthew. And the seventh chapter, verses 21 to 23. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. The New Revised Standard Version. And it is recorded there. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the work of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, and this is Jesus speaking, I never knew you. Go away from me, you who have behaved lawlessly. The word of God for the people of God. The title of our message this morning is Lawless by Nature. Lawless by Nature. Now we know that when we come into the world, as cute as we are, as precious as we are, as adorable as we are, we are designed for self-destruction. As cute as we are, we immediately want to have it our way, from the wound to the tomb, if we don't come to know better through our Lord and our Creator. What does the Bible say about lawlessness? To be lawless is to be contrary to the law or to act without regard to the law. Laws are necessary in a sinful world. And those who choose to act lawlessly further sin. The word for lawless in the Bible is often translated as iniquity. According to the Bible, it's the root of all Lawlessness is rebellion, refusing to comply, resisting. John 3, 4 defines sin as lawlessness. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And to commit sin is to be lawless. And somebody's thinking, well, we all sin. We all sin is what most people are thinking. That's what they're hearing, that we're born sinners. Well, there's some people who practice sin. They go to sleep to sin, they wake up to sin, and while they are going about, they sin, and they have no remorse. They have no guilt. They have no desire to quit. Now, those who are Christians and who have become believers, they've become new creatures. We are new creatures. And behold, the old us has passed away, and there's a new us. And with the new us, we are not sinners. We may error, but we can't do that without consciously being alerted by the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Now, that's the difference between a sinner and a believer. There's got to be a difference. If everybody's going to be a sinner, then what was the purpose of Jesus' death and resurrection? Don't allow yourself to think that you are a sinner unless that's what you are, meaning you enjoy sinning. And to sin, the word says, is to be lawless. You're not complying with the law of God. Does that make you happy to resist God, to push him away, to want no part of him? And what's the stance that most people take around the world? They fold their arms up tight. That's a posture of defense, resistance. The young do it. The middle-aged do it. They're on the covers of magazines. The men and women do it. It used to be just a man's posture. Now there's a woman posture. But... When we sin, that is lawlessness. 
But we are practicing Christians, so we put our energy into obeying the law of God, pleasing God, walking by faith, doing those things that God would have us to do. And we hate sin. When we become believers, we love what God loves, and we hate what God hates. So as I move on to this, to commit sin is to be lawless. That is, the sinner breaks God's law and enjoys doing it, justifies it. And we can see very clearly every day how the law of God is being broken and disregarded. The biblical historian puts his finger on the reason for, for the things that people do. People riot because they want to be heard. They're, they're not silent, peaceful marches for the most part. That's, that's, that's contrary to the nature of man. Man is mostly always riled up about something. It doesn't take much to ruffle a feather. I mean, someone can pull over in front of you and, and, and you're about to have a tizzy. It's if you expect the interstate to be clear just for you. You expect the, the main street to be clear because you're out there. The idea is to drive defensively with gratitude in the car that the Lord has provided for you. With the vision and the wherewithal to be behind the wheel. I mean, you've got enough to do to please God without having to get upset about what somebody else has done to you. If you want to be happy. If you don't want to be happy, look at everything you can possibly find. And I guarantee you, you'll be sad all day. But we're talking about the law, less lawless by nature. By nature, we don't want to confirm. We don't want to conform. We don't want to submit. And so we were looking at the readings of Samuel, 1 Samuel 8, as read by David. David, I want to say thank you so very much for serving as liturgist. You've done exceptionally well. Appreciate you. David Winfield was our liturgist, so thank you. But he read 1 Samuel 8, and in it he is relaying what the prophet Samuel is saying to God's people. And he spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who had asked to have a king. There's, there's a situation going on where Israel no longer wants God to lead them. They no longer want God to be their God and to speak to them through the prophet Samuel. They're just done with that. They want what the other nations have, a king. Now, Jesus, our Savior, had many would-be volunteers who offered to become his followers. And to these volunteers and these wannabes, Jesus and Christ responded with caution. And he says to them, to follow me will cost you. Count the cost. Jesus warned those that say, I want to go with you. I want to be with you. I want to march with you. I want to demonstrate with you. I want to be a part of the movement with you. And Jesus says, fine, but count the cost. And Samuel does the same thing here in this text. He urges the Israelites to count the cost of having a king. Israel's demanding a very expensive kind of government. They have no idea what they're asking for. And Samuel tries his best to, to, to spell out the cost of kingship. And it's extremely expensive. In order for us to appreciate the high cost of having a king, we must first refresh our memories of how things worked under the rule of judges. God worked for them through the judges. God responded to them through the prophets. But all of a sudden now they want a king. In the book of Judges, we see that there is no king, no palace, no standing army. And when Israel is attacked, a volunteer army is assembled together. In part, the army is supplied by the families of those who fight. It gets to be a everybody's involved kind of project. 
You just call your sons out, your sons that are what, 16 to, to 40, <clears throat> and whatever weapons or, or, or things you have in your home that you can share with us, food and containers, let, let us use that. They, they made their own army. There were, there's no administration of counselors and advisors and servants and staffs who support and facilitated the king's reign. In short, the system is very informal and very inexpensive, a very low budget. They just pull together what they have to to prepare to go and fight their enemy. And with God's intervention, they won. But Israel is tired of that. They don't want that anymore. They don't want to see the, the, the movement of God on their behalf. They want a king. Everybody else has a king. So let's see what they're actually getting. Once Israel is given a king, their life on the farm would never be the same. They're asking for a king. They, they really would rather have a king than to have God. That's, that's just two thumbs down to start with. But how can you have your eyes open and not see that that's a poor request? It's an insult to God that you want something other than God to govern you. The king or having a king will draft your sons into military, number one, because the king is going to have an army. Life is not going to be the same anymore once you get this king. We're lawless by nature. They've had God to bring them out of, out of Egypt. And they've seen great signs and wonders. And it's like, that wasn't good enough. They would rather have a king like Pharaoh, whose own son was taken, an army was destroyed. Obviously, they've forgotten what God has done. See, when we forget what God has done for us, we will do something dumb. I mean, just forgetting is dumb. Some things you ought to always remember. And dumb is the right word. I can't think of any other. The king will draft your sons into military service, driving his chariots or serving as a horseman or as one of the infantry. That's what will happen to the sons now, that Israel must have this king. And some will be drafted as officers. And a standing army must also have supplies. So their sons will be used to plant and to harvest crops and to build and to maintain military equipment, not to mention all the non-military supplies that are required, bandages and, 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 and canes and crutches they'll have to make. It is not just the young men whom the king will draft into the service. The Israelites' daughters as well, who once sat and served at their own father's table, will now serve the king's table. They will be perfumers and cooks and bakers. So the families are going to be destroyed, bottom line. To get this king, you're going to lose your sons, you're going to lose your daughters, the family's going to be pulled apart. Isn't that just like when we decide we want to be sinners? We choose a God, and that God will separate us from our families. Whatever that God is, be it at your house, be it at your job, be it the love of your life, as you call it. Whatever that God is that you've so much selected, it's going to pull you from your family, and it's going to consume as much of your time as possible until it consumes you up. That God, that small g, small o, small d. The high cost of a king includes the loss of sons and daughters to the king's service, but the price tag is much larger than what they can see. They can't see how much a king is going to cost. Can you imagine how much the president of the United States costs when you really look at it, all of it? I mean, if you were to add up all of the perks and living rent-free and et cetera, and it says his yearly salary and... and but our nation, that's what we do. We have a president, and most nations have a king. And as a result, some of our children have been drafted over the years. Back in the day, back in the 40s, they were drafted for the, the war, World War I, World War II. They were drafted. They were taken. They were pulled. They were needed. Same thing here. The king will consume a large quantity of food. 
very fine food. And this will require the king to assess a tax upon all that is grown in Israel. Taxing the corn and the beans and the lettuce and the celery. And the best of their grain will go to the king, along with the finest of their vineyards and their groves. What they once had, ah, they have to give it away. Not sell it, give it away. And they still want a king. And Samuel is trying to convey to them, you don't need any other king. All you need is God. He's bought you from a long way. Can you not recall? Can you not remember? This is not a wise decision. A good portion of the fine things an Israelite's farm family could produce gets to go to the king, the finest of it. The king's servants will need to live also, and the people will pick up the tab for this. So there are more taxes you'll have to pay. More of your money you have to get out of your bank and bring it to the king. The king will need a staff to serve him. And so he would take the best Israel has to offer for male and female servants. They're going to take the best. You have a son that's six feet four and strong. He'll be a bodyguard. He'll be one of the... the, the one of those who will protect the palace. He doesn't get to come home and sit on, under your table and, and, and have your turkey wings. That won't happen unless the king says so. You won't get to hug your beautiful daughter who has a gift in playing piano, for instance, because she has to play for the king. And you ask, baby, when are you coming home, mama? I don't know. I don't, I don't get leave. He's having a party. I've got to play. Samuel is saying, you don't want a king. But they're saying, we want a king. We want a king. We want a lawless by nature. Lawless by nature. These people who have known such freedom will now become slaves of the king. And when they, when they finally realize what they've gotten themselves into, it will be too late to change the course of history, too late. And how many times have we, I hope none, but how many times have we refused to do it God's way and just have to do what we want to do for the moment? Did you not have some kind of consequences? Can you recall? The Israelites will someday cry out to God because of the oppression of their king that they've chosen. The day is coming, Samuel's telling them. The day is coming, you are going to cry out because of the oppression and the abuse and the injustices. But God will not be willing to hear your outcry. For you're going into slavery with your eyes wide open. God's not coming to your rescue is what Samuel's saying. Because you're doing, you're deliberately turning your back on God for what you think is better for you. How do you know what's better for you? You didn't make you. God says, I did, so I certainly know what's best for you. Why would you want to go to somebody else who doesn't know you, who doesn't have your best interests at heart? Lawless by nature. And even though Israel is aware, they still desire a king because other nations have one. And they want the king to fight for them. Well, he's going to fight for them. Does God not hear what the people are saying? Of course he hears it. But Samuel goes back and tells him. Because Samuel needs to talk to someone who understands what's going on and they don't. He has to go to God because God has given him the assignment to declare and to warn his people to ring the bell to wake them up. And he goes back to God. He says, God, they're not hearing me. They're not listening to me. What should I do? And God once again instructs him to give the people what they demand. There are times when God will just say, okay, if you insist, 
Mr. Smarty Pants. If you insist on having it your way, so be it. But when you get yourself all tangled up in the web of disappointment, I'm not going to hear you cry. That's what the word says. Some people think God just runs every time we holler. Oh, no, he does not. Sometimes you got to feel the pain because it's like, uh, uh, it's like a man who's married and his wife comes and tells him, I'm leaving you for another man. He's given her everything he has. And he loves her with all his heart. And he's crushed and broken. And he's saying, please don't go. What more can I do to make you happy? Can we go on a trip? Do you want another diamond? What can I do to make you stay with me? Well, everybody else is having an affair. I want to have an affair too. You're boring. Do you think that once she leaves the doorway, that he should be at the doorway waiting for her to come back? It would be nice if he was, but chances are slim to none because he's broken, he's crushed, he's devastated, he's wounded. And this is what God is saying to, to Israel through Samuel. When you go, go. But, when you get all in your stuff and you can't get out, know that I will not hear your cry. I mean, it's just like Jesus was telling Judas, knowing that Judas was the one that's going to betray him. Jesus washed his feet, served him the wine and bread, welcomed him to the table. And in so many words, he's saying, I've done for you what I've done for the others, and you still want to betray me? He says, go and go quickly. Do what you must. Because that young man will wish he was never born, is what's in the word. Uh, lawlessness by nature. The text is a prophecy, and we can see that it is exactly fulfilled what was expected to take place in the line of history. But some things, this book of the, has been written for us to learn from to avoid those things that have happened already. It's to help us to see the way clearly so we won't do it. Why would we want to consider another God? There is no one greater. God said, beside me, there is no other. And sin is like this. Satan is always seeks to sell us on sin. He makes it look good. He makes it look great. He makes it look like you're the first at it. He gives, he gives a crooked street that's definitely crooked to look straight in your eyes until you get into the midst of the street. Satan always seeks to maximize our estimation of the benefit of sin. He, he gives us to think it's not that big of a deal. In the Garden of Eden, Satan deceived Eve into believing that she could actually become like God and that by partaking of the forbidden fruit, that she, it wouldn't really result in death. So after she takes a bite and she's still living, and she takes another bite and she's still living. Yeah. But she's convinced for now for sure. So she calls her husband over. Hey, try this. So oh, cool. Now they knew the rule. Lawless by nature. They knew the rule. God gave it to him at the beginning. The same rule to both of them. Stay away from the tree in the center of the garden. You got all these other trees. 
all this other fruit, all this other opportunity to enjoy the pleasures that I provided for you. Uh-uh, that wasn't enough. They wanted to rebel, wanted to do their own thing. So here we are, having, being born a sinner, having to be drawn to God and take on a new image, a new life. And that's where we are. Lawless by nature. The reality is that sin quickly gains control over us and we become its slaves. That's what happens. I'm going to just do this just, for, this just this once. People are smoking now that never would have wanted to smoke had they known then what they know now. I'm just going to try this just, just once. People that are gambling, had they known then what they know now, that they never would have taken that. I'm just going to invest this money on the table. Sin gains control over us, and it uses you until it uses you up. It has no mercy on your soul. Whenever we are tempted and contemplate choosing the path of sin, let us remember what the Bible teaches us about the economics of sin, that the wages of sin is death. Lawless by nature. So since we've looked at Samuel and him talking to Israel, and we see that he's got nowhere, and God says, let them have a king, please, by all means. Let them have a king. Give them a king, by all means. But when we bring ourselves into distress by our own wrong desires and projects, we justly, we willingly forfeit the comfort of prayer and the benefit of divine aid. When we deliberately turn our backs on God for another God, we forfeit our opportunities for love and for, for deliverance. Now, he'll always love us, but we have to love him. What kind of relationship is it that give all the love and get none? He required us to love him. He says that's one of his commandments. I'm the Lord thy God, love me with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. I mean, we forget that part. And I hear so many people saying, God loves me. Of course he loves you. He's doing his job. We're evident of that. We're breathing and he's allowed us to wake up another day, etc. But do we love him? To love him is to obey him, to fear him, and to love our fellow man. The people were stubborn and pressing in their own demands. Sudden determinations and hasty desires make work for long and leisurely repentance. When we make these wrong decisions away from God, whatever that might be, just this once I'm going to do this, or just this once I'm going to try that, you take a risk. And then you have to repent to return and to right standings with God. You have, to, you have to do more than say, I'm sorry. You have to repent. Repent means to turn away from, not to do anymore, to hate the act that you've performed and to see the repercussion of it. That's repentance. Sometimes that takes a while. It's more than, I'm sorry, it's more than that. That's why people go to court, because even though they may push you down the stairs accidentally, to stand over you and say, oh, I'm sorry. I was just trying to get by with my book in my bag. And just to walk away, no. That's not good enough. To, to call for help, to stay there with them until help arrives, to go with them to the emergency room and to find out their status, to give them your name, and to show some compassion is the bottom line. How many people do that? Oh, no. What the Bible says about lawlessness, God has a purpose for establishing human government to punish those who do wrong, and to commend those who do right. That's the game rules. You do right, you're awarded. You do wrong, there's consequences. Rulers are God's appointees to maintain order and promote righteousness in a civil society. Rules are necessary, obviously. You have a toddler, you have to tell that toddler, no, don't. 
That toddler is going to insist on destroying himself. It's going to stick his finger in the plug. It's going to pull a lamb off the table. You have to teach even a toddler, no, don't do that, sweetie, and distract them with something else that's safer. Because we're lawless by nature. We don't want to go by the rules. We're lawless by nature. We don't want to obey until we come into the knowledge of God and see the beauty of a wholesome relationship through obedience and yielding to his word and his will and his way. But until then, we remain lawless by nature and there are consequences for not going by the law. Our lawless re deeds results in Christ's death, but God's grace overcomes our lawless hearts. In judgment, many will stand before Christ claiming a connection with him that, that exists only in their own minds. Because as I read in the second reading there in Matthew, it says many will be calling, Lord, Lord. And he said, I don't know you. But in the mind of those who think that they're with God and they're going to do whatever they want and they're breaking the, the laws, they will rehearse their good deeds done in his name only to hear Jesus declare them to be workers of lawlessness, workers of sin. Many people come to church and they say they're, they're Christians. They say it with their lips. But it's not in their heart. They come under the image of Christianity, and many don't even say it through their lips. I don't hear many confessions that I love the Lord. I don't hear many confessions that I I'm, I'm once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. I don't hear that. I don't know about you. Maybe you do. But for the most part, I hear my head hurt, my knee hurt. I went to the cell. There was a markdown. I hear all these other conversations of social relations, but I don't hear a lot of professions of our love for, for God. Do I see a lot of it? Somebody might open a door, but I've seen people open a door and the one that walks through doesn't even say thank you. I've seen people come together in the same space. No one says good morning. I just, I, what the word is saying here is that at the time those who practice lawlessness would be cast into a blazing furnace, is what Jesus says in Matthew 7. While those who are covered by righteousness of Christ will shine like the sun. And Christ will have the ultimate victory and will el eliminate lawlessness forever. The law is for our benefit. It's to bless us, the law. Even though we're lawless by nature, we have to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We have to change. We have to come into the will of God. We have to want to be governed by him, to be led by him. And here it is, God is really pleading with his own people, do not leave me for a king. And they can't get enough of the idea of a king. And you know the king... They, of course, they didn't give it who it was at that time. They just, Samuel sent them home. The bottom line, it says, God will tell me who the king will be. He says, you can have a king, but for now, just go home. We're gathered together when the Lord gives me the name of the king. You know who the king was? It was Saul. Tall, dark, and handsome, adorable-looking Saul. He was a good-looking guy, a good-looking king. Tall and buff. He was everything you want. If you wanted a king. Couldn't have gotten a better looking one. But he was, he was like a, I would say he was like a, a lion. Watching his prey, looking at their young sons and their young daughters and, 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 and scouting the area as soon as he came on the scene. And deciding what vineyards he wanted. I mean, the greed in him was unbelievable. But they had to have a king. And we know the story of Saul and the suffering of God's people under his leadership. And God is telling us, just because you look like you're a part of me, I know you. I know your heart. I know your thoughts. I know your deeds. You can't hide from me. We understand that it's not enough to say, I believe in Jesus. We must also live in accordance with what we believe. 
We can't just say it. We have to live in accordance with that. There must be a trail of good works that characterize our lives in Christ. After all, believers do have the Holy Spirit abiding in us who not only sanctifies us, but enables us to bear the fruits of the Spirit. We should have love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, and definitely self-control. I mean, that's what the Holy Spirit does inside of us. And even though you can do wrong if you choose to do wrong, but you're not going to be happy with yourself until you come to grips and say, Lord, I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. And some things you have to grab yourself that you think that you don't have no business thinking. Oh, yeah, I, have, I even have to chastise myself. And I'm pretty hard on me, I think. I have to make me do right. Just like we have to make ourselves get up and go to a doctor's appointment. You want to lay there and it's raining outside. It's cold. But you, you will that body to get up and go to that doctor's appointment. And if you can will your body to do that, you can will your body to do right. You can will that mind to do right. When you get to that doctor's office and he tells you uh, how to breathe, you concentrate because you want everything, to, the report to be a good report. He says, take a deep breath. That's silence for a minute. It's hard for some people, but they do it. They say, hold it. I'll tell you when to release it. Do a good job at that exam because you want a good report. We can do what we want to do. It's the bottom line. But we can be reminded that we're lawless by nature, but in Christ we can do all things. With him, with God, we are the majority. So we need not worry about being just one or being small in numbers. The most important thing is that you could be in a church filled with lots of people, a mega church, and you can rest assured, in a mega church, how many really know God? That is a network center. People bring their business cards and their exchange cards and save them a lot of, a lot of driving back and forth. Hey, I can fix your car. Oh, I can sell you a house. Oh, I can do your interior decorating. Oh, here, take my card. I can style your hair. And this goes on, shifting, carrying on. It, it can't help it. Mega church, thousands of people, three and four services on a given day. A lot of business operations go on. On the table and under the table. Can't help it. Lots of people. And everybody in there doesn't love the Lord. They like the atmosphere. They like the reputation that comes with it. They like the opportunities for success that are there. But I would rather be with a small number who are striving for the kingdom of God any day. That's like making that choice between Israel and the king or Israel and God. I would rather be Israel and God any day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you for your listening ear. I pray that something has been said that will make a complete difference in the rest of your life. I hope we're the better for having come to worship today.